when I think about Studio DAO, I think about this as like how we're making a blockchain based experience. It uses crypto, but I think that is not something that is necessarily going to be in the long run something that anyone cares about. When the 10 millionth person is onboarded onto a blockchain application, it's not because they're going to be like, I need to be a part of like the crypto revolution. They're just going to be like, oh, this is this works better for me. And some it provides some function or some experience that you couldn't get in another way. What we're doing at Juicebox, what we're doing at Studio DAO, it all has to be in the lens of building the prototypes for the things that can become a lot bigger once they're simplified. I think that's what this next phase is going to be all about. So once people realize blockchain isn't going away, no matter what the price of ETH is, like that's kind of like the core application. And so how do we build blockchain applications that coordinate communities to do things that they want to do that actually becomes regenerative in some way? I think we're going to start to see that in the fall, like the beginning of those conversations, because people are going to get bored of being in a bear market. Welcome to the Juicebox podcast. My name is Matthew. And I'm Briley. And in this series of conversations, we'll be sitting down with the builders and community members of the Juicebox ecosystem. Today, we'll be talking with Kenny from Studio Dow. Studio Dow is a decentralized movie studio owned by filmmakers and fans. Community members source, greenlight, fund, and distribute movies while creators retain 100% of their creative control and ownership. Fans can help fund films and receive NFT rewards, access to exclusive content, and have a say in governance for the community wallet. In this episode, Kenny tells us about his long career in the media and entertainment industry and how Studio Dow is flipping the script on the traditional studio model. As someone who is closely involved in the early history of interactive media and later the transition from cable to streaming, Kenny shares his vision for how a community-owned studio can create space for content that is otherwise lost to algorithms and business models of companies like Netflix. We hope you enjoy this week's episode. One question we did have for you before we started was, should we call you Ken, Kenny, Kenbot? Like, what is the preferred nomenclature, you know? (laughs) Kenny. I've been Kenny my whole life. I mean, the reason it's Kenbot is this was actually my AOL name, and that was you know Kennybot didn't sound good or cool for your IM address, so it was Kenbot. Rachel's here laughing at me. Yeah, so that's <laughs> so that just kind of hung in there, and then I was like, okay, when Twitter started, I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna kind of move it over here. So, but Kenny, Kenny, Kenny's great. All right, <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kenny. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm <laughs> good. Is it funny? <laughs> no, it's just funny because we we just had this long conversation about your name and spending it, you know, two minutes like dissecting like Ken, Kenny, Kenbot, you know, all these AOL <laughs> names. But it's funny how often, you know, you're saying like, well, I use this as my AOL screen name. That is, I would say, probably the most common source for a pseudonym is like, oh, this was my screen name back in, you know, on uh, MSN or AOL or even like an IRC chat. So it, it's funny how often these names stick for people and it becomes a, a core part of their Web3 identity. So it's a way that we... Uh, are navigating the internet over this long span of time. And it's nice to hear these stories. And bots weren't a bad thing, like at that point. At that point. At that point. (laughs) At that point. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, every time I see your name, like your screen name, Kenbot, on screen in Discord or on Twitter, I, I always think of a, a type of pepper called Kampot, which we're, we're a big fan of. It's it's just a particular type of pepper from Cambodia. And every time I see Kenbot, I think of Kampot. And we just ran out of this pepper. We bought this like one kilogram bag maybe a year ago, and we just ran out. So every time I see your name, I'm like, ah, pepper, got to go get pepper. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I just wanted to start by acknowledging that, Kenny, you are uh, somewhat of an unstoppable force. I remember I remember seeing you around Shark Dow when I first joined, which is just before we uh, got the shark down. And the consensus was kind of like, Kenny knows everyone, and you just seem to kind of make things happen. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your background in media before we get into Studio Dow. Like, what, what is the, the Kenny origin story here? 
I think like many people, I was fascinated with entertainment as a kid and a young adult. And that was anything from animated content to sci-fi and things that were really exciting. And I wanted to be a part of that. But I also, as a kid, was really fascinated with technology and programming and taught myself to program and did crazy things like build robots in high school when, I don't know when that was. I think that's like, Eight. yeah. Yeah, like in the early 80s. And I know, so I sort of did like a lot of experimenting and ended up getting a degree in computer engineering, like really sort of going deep on the technology side of it. But then I really wanted to be more in the media business. And I ended up having sort of like this corporate consulting job where we were making software, writing sales systems and accounting systems for people. Like that's what technology was at that phase. And that was just like the birth of what people would call like either interactive media or multimedia or experiments that were going on at the media lab were very inspirational. And I ended up going back to school and getting a master's degree at NYU from this interesting part of the Tisch School of the Arts called the Interactive Telecommunications Program. And that was just this amazing interdisciplinary group. Like the head of the department would recruit people who were filmmakers and dancers and painters and teachers and programmers and musicians and like sound technologists to just come together and create this soup of experimentation. So that's where I met Rachel, who's a part of Studio Dow and my wife, and just kind of made a lot of really interesting connections at what was like the birth of technology getting integrated into the media industry. So I went to school there. I then ended up working at Apple for a year as like some weird post-grad intern, semi-artist in residence, (laughs) semi-just making demos of what user interfaces should start to look like. It was the launch of QuickTime. So there was a lot of experimentation with like, how could you make a 3D QuickTime video? And what would that look like? And how could you make these things clickable and more interactive onto themselves? So I met a lot of people through that. I worked in California for a year and then wanted to go back to New York. So I moved back to New York and ended up becoming the first, this is terrifying, the first digital employee at Viacom who, you know, they were like, okay, we have MTV, we have Nickelodeon, we have all these great things and we know technology is going to affect it and we need someone to help us figure out like, what should we do? So I helped to build some of the first video games for those brands and different kinds of interactive experiences. But as a part of that, it was also those companies were very small at that time. You know, I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but maybe it was like 400 people working at Nickelodeon, like 600 people working at MTV, like just like really, this is like 1992. So we did everything from like Nintendo and Sega cartridges to CD-ROMs to experimental installations. So yeah, so I spent a long time working at Viacom. I founded multiple cable networks there. I don't know if there's a network called Noggin. That's one of the proudest projects that I ever got to work on. And so that was basically a joint venture between Sesame Street and Nickelodeon to do a new kind of commercial-free educational television for kids. And we built a bunch of amazing stuff there. And that brand still is going. And I've met professionals who are doing great. And we end up talking about what they've done and where they came from. And the most amazing one is like, someone was like, oh, when I was four years old, I spent every single day on Naga.com. Like every afternoon, I was on Naga.com doing this stuff. And I'm like, okay, and now you're like a brilliant software programmer. So yeah, so I've just been always fascinated with media and interactive systems. And what can we do that is fun and interesting and helps people connect with each other and get perspectives on what might be interesting in the world. So I did that at Viacom for a long time. And then I worked at Disney for five years doing similar kinds of projects and the, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. I, I feel like I'm going, this is like too much of a monologue though. So why do, why does it seem like <laughs> I know everyone? So I, I do know a lot of people and I've tended to give people insights into things like streaming, like what's going to happen when you can stream all of your television shows, like what happens in that world. And so in the companies, these big companies where I worked, I was often in the role of sharing like, okay, this is what we think is going to happen and this is how the world's going to roll out 
out. And even though those companies were absolutely terrible at taking the advice that I was giving them because it's hard to change from one kind of company into another, all the people that I talked to about it in terms of what we were supposed to do, even though we weren't able to do it, so many of them have come back to me and they're like, how did you know? Like, what is this thing? And so now when we start getting into this world of what's going to happen in the world of more consumer power and less middlemen, which I think is the operational difference of blockchain applications versus traditional client server. Definitely. They're all really interested. So even though I kind of jumped from the traditional world doing technology that supports traditional business models for traditional media companies into how do we actually flip the script and make this something that can totally empower audiences and filmmakers to coordinate themselves without the need to cut in traditional media companies. So many people are game to get involved. And they're like, I didn't understand what streaming was going to be. I didn't understand what the internet's going to be. And I definitely don't understand what crypto is going to be. But if you think that that's actually an interesting thing for us to talk about and work on, I'm all ears. Yeah. Can you tell us how you made the transition to Web3 from working with those traditional tech and media companies like Apple and Disney? Totally. So I left Disney about three years ago. And for a year and a half, two years, I was working at this small political media startup called The Recount, which is the idea behind The Recount was that people would be interested in what's a video newsletter? Why isn't there something like that, right? Like either it's long form television news, or you've got these newsletters that are really condensed and, you know, and are more time efficient. Can we make a video product that has the communicative nature of video news, but is more digestible. So we were working on that through the Trump years and into the pandemic. Then one of the backers of the recount is a famous investor, Fred Wilson, who runs Union Square Ventures. And he has been investing in crypto for 10 years. And he was like, I think you guys are doing it wrong. Actually, like there's all this stuff going on in crypto and you should just take a look at how would you apply crypto to the media business and could we use that to help the recount in some way. So I went through the whole process and like news is hard because it doesn't necessarily have like long-term value. Like yesterday's news is not anything that anyone wants to watch. So as I was learning about crypto and Fred was helped introduce me to some people who could fast forward my education into it, I was like, okay, I don't really think that there's a fix for news, but I think that there's something amazing in the more traditional media business where you could actually build a studio or a network that was owned by the people who made the content and by the people who consume the content together. And that that would be a really interesting kind of decentralized application to build that does that coordination between those people. And so I left the recount because I was like, okay, also having gone through <laughs> just like the whole 2020 election and all of that stuff, I was like, I'm done with news. I really don't need any more news content in my life. <laughs> I want to move on from this. So, right. so I left the recount and I was like, let's do something new. And I just said, here, I'm going to buy some NFTs. I'm going to try to figure this out. And first I messed around with Top Shot a little bit. Like I bought some Top Shot cards and I was like, okay, like I get that. I understand that. And then I bought two Blit maps when they were minting. And that introduced me to a, a whole bunch of interesting people. And just like, what does that look like and feel like? And the Blit map community is really interesting. And then I minted a tile. And when I minted the tile, you know, I'm pretty technical. So I was like, okay, I'm going to check out either scan and figure out how this all worked. And then when I saw that I had gotten 72,000 tiled tokens, I was like, what the hell is this? Like, what are what are these tokens? Like, how does that work? And that led me into Juicebox, where I met Django and Perry. I was curious and, you know, I was willing to go out and spend 100 bucks or 200 bucks on something and see like, okay, just like, am I really going to buy this JPEG for $200 or this on-chain token? Like, it seemed totally crazy at the time to be doing it, but we did it and just dug in from there. And I think then the next part of the journey that was kind of like, it's hard to believe that this all came together. As a part of researching Studio DAO, I was interested in this idea of, could we build an application where people could essentially mint ideas for movies as NFTs? And then if those ideas got energy, people could basically back that NFT. Essentially, we were calling it like proof of word. You go, you write the log line, you mint it, and then that's your kind of on-chain proof that this is your idea. And we build right. a treasury around that. So. When I was researching that, I was like, okay, NFTs about words, texts, and whatever. And for some reason, because I said like NFTs about words or text surfaced nouns 
for me as a result and nouns was on Rinkby. So I ended up jumping into the testing group for nouns, figuring out what Rinkby was, begging some friends for Rinkby ETH so that I could win one of the noun auctions on Rinkby before it went off. And so I won noun number 76 on the test net. And if you won one noun, then you were admitted into SharkDAO. So I was a part of SharkDAO on Rinkby. And then when nouns was going to go live, all the people that were in SharkDAO that weren't actual whales were like, okay, I cannot going to be able to afford this, banded together to try to figure out how to win. We wanted to win the first now. That was like the idea that we were going to organize and do that. Right. And the team was like totally just chaos, like because no one was in charge. No one really started. <laughs> it was just kind of like this coalescing of things. And I thought that Juicebox would be a really interesting way to coordinate the treasury for SharkDAO. So I brought Django to come into the Discord and be like, hey, there's like a bunch of people in here. We need help organizing this treasury. He comes in, he pitches it. People flip out. They're like, we don't know what Juicebox is. This could be a scam. We don't know Django. Like, it's like, you don't know me. You don't know any of these other people. But just because he was like brand new at that second. But then like a day went by and we couldn't get ourselves organized. And someone else, not me, was like, maybe Juicebox is a good idea. Like, can we get Jago back in here? So yeah, so it was kind of like a wild sort of connecting from one thing to another, like starting with tiles and then like ending up in nouns and then sharked out and then closing the loop back to Juicebox. It's wild. Okay, so... Before we jump into Studio DAO, can you tell us about the traditional studio model for film production? Like how are movies usually funded and what is the over process from start to finish? We should talk about this in two steps, right? It's like most of my career I've worked at cable television networks. So cable television networks work in a very specific way. They have a lot of syndicated content, a lot of repeats, like filling 24 hours a day is a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bunch of series, but it turns out that most of what people watch across all of cable, and it doesn't matter, it could be HBO, it could be a traditional, you know, it could be Comedy Central, is they watch movies. And then, you know, people think about the television networks in terms of the original shows that they make, but those shows are very rarely the largest part of the consumption or the real business. It's like those shows are things that get people to come maybe be aware of the network, but it isn't really the heart of the business. It always ends up being these movies. So I just think movies are a fantastic kind of content because you can be very experimental. You only have to make one. It's not like a television series where people are trying to factor in the idea of, can I make 20 episodes of this, 50 episodes of that? There's only certain kinds of ideas that I think, honestly, are maybe not the most interesting ones that kind of fit into the TV format. So I just think the future of narrative content, I think, is more about movies and less about series as the world goes on. So that's what kind of like made me think that movies are really interesting format to work on this problem with in terms of how do we coordinate audiences and filmmakers to make stuff together. So with that as background, the traditional studio model is today IP driven. You want to have a franchise, whether it's Harry Potter or Minions or Star Wars or Marvel, whatever it is, people are terrified of the marketing problem of having to introduce new IP to the world and having to invest everything on something that's like the first of its kind. And you just get into these problems inside of big media companies, which is, would you be better off spending $50 million dollars on this Marvel movie or investing $50 million in some other idea. And it almost always comes back that it's better to put money into the thing that you already know works than inventing the new thing. And that has led to a real freezing out of new ideas and new concepts being brought to market, which I think in the indie film world is the perfect place to create those structures and have new talent be able to show up and make something that's beautiful and arresting. So that's just like all the philosophy around those things and some of the business strategy. The economic model for indie films is pretty simple. You know, you have budget, you will look for financing for that film. Let's say you're trying to make a $3 million film and you find someone to finance it. They put up the $3 million, they get 120%, depending on the number, it could be 115, it could be 125. Let's just say 120% of their money back, right? So the first $3.6 million to come back from the project pays back the financiers with interest. 
and then the financiers get 50% of everything after that. So they get paid back and then they own half of it. What we're going to do is we're basically creating a legal structure and a technology capability for a community, for a DAO, to act in place of the financiers, but to not have to recoup the money so the filmmakers can participate from the beginning of any revenue that's generated from the project by doing it with the community, if that makes sense. Okay, all right, let's dive right into Studio DAO then. So for fans who want to contribute, they'll put funds in, which will help fund the movies, but they won't necessarily expect any return on that. They, they'll be sort of involved as the backers, but also sort of like the consumers of the content. So can you tell us about how NFTs fit into this and how Juicebox's new NFT rewards functionality will fit into this? Absolutely. So what we're doing is we're essentially creating a structure where each film comes in, they do a deal with the community. We have a traditional contract which gets signed. And what that does is lays out like the relationship between the filmmaker and the community and how any revenue in the future will get split. Then we open a juice box where you can buy an NFT. We'll have three tiers. We're making it simple. 0.01, 0.1, and 1 ETH are the three levels of buying in to support a particular film. With that NFT, that then gets you access to the rest of what is going to be going on with Studio Dad that we'll just kind of put a pin in for a second. So just to make it like super concrete, the first film that we're financing is this film called Unlikely Love Stories. That's from these creators, Rosa Tran and Derek Smith. She is an executive producer on Robot Chicken, and they produce Anomalisa, which is an Oscar-nominated animated feature. And so this one, it's Twisted Love Stories. And so it's an anthology series where we're going to be producing them four to six minutes at a time with individual episodes that together, then when we have 10 of those, that becomes a movie that we can release. But at the beginning, they're just shorts. So we're trying to raise... $305,000 to do the first episode of Unlikely Love Stories with Rosa and Derek. So you come in, you buy your NFT, 90% of that goes to support the film, 10% supports just the development of the studio overall, and then you are a part of the DAO. And that's where we think it gets even more interesting as how do we sort of build that bigger community? And so people who are members of the DAO have a bunch of different activities that they can engage with. One of the more interesting ones is we're going to have a separate fund that has more money to support more content. And so once you support a film, you will be able to guide the community wallet that is generated from the revenue that comes back to the DAO as these projects make their way out to market. So I'm going to make it simple, right? So we make it, we make unlikely love stories. Someone, you know, a traditional media company or some streamers like, oh, this is great. We want this movie and we're willing to pay you a million dollars for it. Great. There's a split that goes to the filmmaker immediately. And there's a split that goes into the community wallet. How do we decide what to do with that community wallet? That's the way that we're defining DAO is, I think, not the way that most DAOs have been defined so far, right? Like, you know, at Juicebox, we've all been there. It's like, okay, what are we doing? Like, there's a big, wide mandate at Juicebox to maybe do a lot of different things and figure out, like, how to make that work. We're going in the opposite direction. When you're a member of Studio DAO, you basically greenlight movies, you participate in the creation of those movies by being like you're on the inside because you hold these NFTs and then we watch movies and that's it. So we're trying to make it very powerful by making it the decision of what to green light is an interesting one. And I think that's like mm-hmm. good fodder for community activity to be like, okay, well, is it this one or that one? Like, how should we do that? But we're digesting the process through the technology so that when you buy this NFT, you know, I was actually, it's funny, I was building the prototype of this in Snapshot over the weekend that like you hold the NFT, that NFT has a certain value in the community and you can use that value to steer the community assets towards those movies that you think are gonna serve the studio better in the future. And in that way it becomes regenerative, right? Like we make content, the money doesn't leave the ecosystem in terms of if you hold a token, 
the token doesn't pay a dividend. Like that's, that's not what we're doing. What you have is a membership in this nonprofit organization that is optimizing for content instead of revenue. Can you tell us a bit about the process of pitching a film? So we've gone over how fans fit into this system, but how would a filmmaker go about getting their work produced through Studio Dow? Right now, there's about three to five films that we're getting ready to put up on the platform. And what we'll do going forward is the filmmaker comes in. I think someone who's already in the DAO has to kind of be their contact, help them make a pitch to the rest of the DAO. And then you get voted in because... It should be an open platform in terms of anyone can make a proposal, but the curation of what's actually available on it is important. So you make a proposal, the DAO will vote. That means then that we can open the juice box and that anyone who buys tokens to support your film through that juice box also is getting closer to Studio DAO through the holding of those tokens. So that's why we sort of need that first curation to make sure that just You can't just apply, sell some tokens, and then essentially anyone's in the community. It needs to be a little more filtered than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the process. Then we open up the juice box, and then funding can come from essentially three different places. Funding can come from NFT sales. Funding can come from the green light wallet as the community allocates resources towards it, and we're designing. It's the green light game. And so you basically, you buy your token, Now you get to play the green light game, which is allocating other people's money to the projects, which is really the fun of being in a studio. It's like not like spending your own money is scary, but spending other people's money is super fun. So that's kind of the game that we're building towards. That's the second kind of money. The third kind of money that can support your film is just traditional financing. Like if someone has a project and the project is a $3 million project, they've already raised a million dollars or $2 million, but they need another million to close it, we can take that to the NFT community. We can take that to the green light wallet and see if the existing DAO wants to allocate resources that we have towards it. Because we believe that it's a hybrid world. Trying to do things 100% on chain when there's such a big vibrant ecosystem to support it already. We want to be able to play on both sides of it because we think that the world of tapping into fans and letting fans have a piece of the action in one way is definitely a trend that is going to take hold one way or another. And Mm -hmm. by not having to be pure about it, it gives us more capability to partner because a lot there's a lot of great projects out there where they have there's some backing but they don't have it all. So sort of starting from the ground up isn't the only thing that we care about. But I think really creative, low budget things are also interesting. Like I would love to figure out, and I think I'll just kind of drop this on the podcast and we'll see. Like <laughs> we're, we're deep enough in that only the most, only, only the most intrepid listeners will be at this point. <laughs> but what would a juice box film festival look like? Mm. Like, I don't think it's million dollar films. Mm-hmm. You know, if we wanted to do something where it was like, here, we're going to try to green light a $50,000 film once a week. What would that look like? And can we do that for a month and build Mm -hmm. something and finance some creators in an interesting way? So as we get closer to having the MVP really operate, and every time I show it to someone, we're like, okay, this is, you take this step, and then they get it. They're like, oh, you could do this and you could do that. And it's because it is because of the legal structures and the way that we've been able to build this system really in harmony with the way that Juicebox already works. Mm -hmm. It gives us the ability to like do little things, do big things. There's a lot of room to invent how films actually get financed. But if you're a traditional filmmaker and you have a script and you have a project and there's people involved with it, then we just take that out and build a Juicebox and get going from there. Yeah, legal concerns for DAOs seems to be a hot topic lately. And Studio DAO is an UNA and Backlot is an LLC, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Should we talk about what a UNA is? Because people probably... Yeah, yeah. I'd love if you could talk about each of them and how they fit into the picture together. What is a UNA? <laughs> what is a UNA? <laughs> totally. So, um, so we have a couple things going on. 
The idea of a DAO has sort of been outside of normal legal constructs. People are like, is there a foundation? Is there an LLC? How does this all work together? You know, mm-hmm. nouns DAO, like people are making companies in the Cayman Islands, all kinds of stuff. The direction that we're taking is we have registered something called the Studio DAO UNA. And UNA is an unincorporated nonprofit association. And so there's 15 states in the United States where these are recognized legal structures, and Nevada is one of them. And so we've okay. actually created this organization in Nevada. It stood up, and that will be when you join the DAO you join the UNA and that that's what the legal thing that you're actually a part of by buying that token and certifying to the governance overview of Studio DAO. Right. And it's interesting because the structure, it's the structure of homeowners associations and a number of other kinds of nonprofit associations that we're not talking about like Nonprofit, like philanthropic nonprofit. It's not a 501c3 or anything like that. It is just informal association of members who are agreeing to abide by a certain set of governance rules. And then that membership can't make profit from owning your membership, but you can participate in what that membership gives you. And so our studio and our network, like our ambition is to have a million people join that UNA, join Studio DAO, and be able to greenlight content basically at the price of a movie ticket. Can we get a million people to cooperate and everybody puts in $10 or $20 or $100 to make a 10, 20, or $100 million movie? So I think we're years off from being able to execute on that, but the path to that collective action and to that legal structure is to set up this UNA, build the DAO around it, establish how filmmakers work with what is essentially a nonprofit studio run by a collective, and then scale the projects that are flowing through that pipeline. So that's our roadmap. And so the legal organization is the UNA for the DAO. And then we have something else called Studio DAO Backlot, which is a for-profit LLC. Right. That's where people can work, and where we can do some of the things that need to be done to support the UNA. And so let the DAO be really focused on just what we're talking about. It's about holding the green light votes. It's a membership organization and we're doing the service. So it's certainly not as developed, but the structure is not dissimilar from SushiSwap in terms of there's a protocol, there's a team that actually builds the app and that services the protocol, but the community owns the protocol and the team that's doing the building has like a little bit more of a traditional software entity, but isn't controlling the protocol. That's the point, to let the community actually have that decentralized control. And can you tell us more about Studio DAO's roadmap for the next few years? You've hinted at a few things, but do you have more alpha to share about some of the more ambitious big picture goals for the DAO? Absolutely. Right now, today, we are building the proof of concept on RinkB along with the Juice Box NFT rewards release. And so that's that's just like what are we doing in the next month, the next two months? We're doing that and we're working with the team to make sure that there's features where I'm the first person touching those features to go sort of like make them work. And like there's unnecessarily file size limits on uploading the NFTs. There's issues with like the metadata. So we're working through all of that in the short term to get it stood up. Our goal is to, I'll just kind of like lay this out there. We want to transact in Rink B with 100 people to sell 100 NFTs into 100 Rink B NFTs out there. Once we get to that point, then we're ready to go and release those juice boxes. And then we want to elevate the community to 1,000 people through those first juice box sales and funding the first few films and getting over that step. We're raising our seed round right now, and that energy mainly is going to go towards how do we get from 1,000 people to 10,000 people? What's the step from 10,000 people to 20 or 50 or 100,000 people? And we think that that is a much better user experience 
you know, when we onboard people, I don't know if you onboarded normal people been like, okay, now you need to download MetaMask and this is what you're doing there. It's like incomprehensible to people who don't care about it a lot. And we want this to be more casual. So we have a roadmap for a greatly simplified consumer experience where you're able to buy in with fiat and that the other part of getting to scale is having enough projects to pick from in terms of what do you want to back? Because I think a lot of the challenge that people have experienced so far in this market is they're like, hey, we're making a decentralized studio. So I have a film. Do you want to finance this film? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, if someone shows you a single thing, odds are it's not going to be that interesting to you. You're trying to pick out from a list. So that's mm -hmm. kind of like our, in my mind, getting to the place where within three months, six months, can we get to the place where there are 10 to 20 projects that are available for funding on the platform and then simplifying that experience so that we can get that in front of many more people and grow from there. Because it is definitely... There's a chicken and egg. I'm going to mix my metaphors. There's a chicken and egg cold start problem around all of that issue, right? Like, how do you get enough projects? People don't want to put projects on a platform where projects aren't funding, but also people who are interested in new ideas need to see enough variety in those new ideas to pick out the ones that speak to them. So working those back and forth, I think that's really what our next year is about is solving those problems dynamically as they come up. Is it a problem that we don't have enough people who are interested in funding it? Or is the problem that there aren't enough projects? And I think we'll go back and forth. Sometimes it'll be one, sometimes it'll be the other. And that's, I think, just the pain that we're signing up for by starting this <laughs> and working out those problems. Right. That's what we want to get to. And I, I think it's like a like three-year thing to get to a really significant audience. But, you okay. know. Could go faster. We'll see. Like, let's see what let's see what happens this fall. You've described Juicebox as enabling collective action, which I think is a useful mental model. How does this relate to Studio Dow's mission? I think it's very aligned. One of the things that I love about Juicebox, like the projects that have sort of like you'll have someone who's you know, oh, well, someone puts in ten ETH on something that's great, and then someone comes in and puts in like 0.01 or put like 0 0.002 or something like that, just to get their memo up on the feed and to make their mark. And so I really like the idea of communities that are not as restrictive as I think some of the stuff that we've seen get popular, right? Where it's like, there's only a thousand of these tokens. And so, you know, it's like, there's a lot of FOMO and people buying in around that stuff. But I think it's more interesting to try to build value by making it affordable and having more people join. That's that's kind of like our model is that you can come in and that's why we're sort of like making the lowest token 0.01. So even though we're not talking about Ethereum prices right now, it's about the price of a movie ticket. And so you can become a part of it and join for that and then see if you like what's going on and participate in the green light votes and the rest of it as a fan. So instead of just being a consumer for 15 or $20, you're now a participant. And that's just, people like to participate. And that's something that's just like across my career, whenever I've sort of built a system that let people be creative, but in a way that is relatively painless, it's not hard work, we made animation tools and all kinds of stuff that just let people kind of work on rails. And this is that kind of, idea. You come in, you pick from one of the 10 that you'd like to back, but you get access to all of them. Like if they all get funded, they'll all be a part of the studio. So it isn't like you're saying no to the other things. You're just picking what your favorite is. And if other people have other favorites, that's great. But your question was about the collective action, right? Like that's yeah. the, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's the thing. That's why I just think like the world that we're in of everything that has from the crypto mania to things like Wall Street bets, and then just what's happened on Juicebox in the last year. When something starts to get momentum, people just love to participate. Something, something that's just like silly, but I think also instructive is when people do the wave at a giant stadium. It's like, <laughs> why do people do that? What is it about that? You know exactly what to do. People do it. They love it. It's thrilling. And, or it's like, I don't know, singing along at a concert. Like, 
how do we have like those big group experiences? And I think it's funny, we, we started off with like the, mon- the mundane nature of post-pandemic life, but we still want to connect. And I think what I experienced in those days through like the Shark Dow stuff as it was forming was, you know, people were at home and here was a thing that we could do that was fun and interesting and had a tangible output from the effort that we all made together. And you just get into a good virtuous cycle with the community that you're a part of in terms of getting things done. And I think that builds relationships and that's just sort of like a a great human thing and figuring out how to build a blockchain application and a blockchain driven community that can coordinate to make movies seems like a magical moment. When we fund our first one, that will be the big moment when we can pass $300,000 for Rose's first film that we're doing. We'll see what happens with that community that we're building. Is it important that Studio DAO be governed as a DAO? It feels like a lot of DAOs are more interested in the sort of cultural cachet of the term DAO than actually implementing meaningfully decentralized governance. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how the ethos of DAOs relates to the Studio DAO mission. Mm, That's a great question. I think for it to become as fully big as I think it can become, it needs to be like a decentralized organization that shares this protocol. So I think right now we're setting it up so it has the lane to become decentralized. You can't start it decentralized, right? There's always, there's got to be some people at the center of it. And so that's why we've kind of split this structure, like the UNA on one side, the backlot on the other side. But the reason that we're doing that is really not necessarily to give it the most help in the short term is to give it the most options in the long term in terms of when the community takes control, the community can decide to do whatever it wants to do. There's so it'll have films, it'll have this technology platform that is based on Juicebox to operate on. And then if the community decides that it wants to become fully decentralized, then it can vote to do that and basically dissolve the relationship with Backlot, and then it becomes its own decentralized organization. And I think that gives it other possibilities that as a decentralized org, there's things that that community can do that can't be done for it by a centralized group. That's the structure of progressive decentralization. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of our dream, that it becomes this perpetual thing that helps public goods get created in a way that's fair to the creators and consumers of those public goods. Right. So does it get there? We're going to take a shot. (laughs) Like that's what we're setting it up to do. And I think that's just what's so interesting and honestly different about blockchain and crypto and just token driven economies is it's perpetual and independent in a way that no client server application ever really can be. And by doing this together with Juicebox, were built to be decentralized in a way the the care and thought into what Juicebox's decentralization roadmap looks like and what the vector is for Juicebox to really become decentralized enables applications that are built on Juicebox to follow that same path. So there's like this kind of compounding thing that as Juicebox is coming together the use case for then building other decentralized platforms on top of Juicebox. That should be the reason to use Juicebox if you want to make a decentralized community that operates in this way. And when we did SharkDAO, we didn't know what Anuna was. Like, it just was kind of this messy thing. But now that we know more about these little structures and how to incorporate these things as nonprofits so they can really be community-owned and the people who join them don't have to be afraid. So far, the space is accommodated like and attracted risk takers. People are like, okay, I wanna do something new and I'm willing to take some risk to figure out how those things work. That's not 99% of the world. Like a lot of people are very adverse to risk. Mm-hmm. So if we want people to get the power of ownership and being in control of their own situation, we need to make that a little simpler and clearer. So, so yeah. By defining a DAO in this very narrow way, by setting it up as a nonprofit and by building it as a system on top of juice box, Mm -hmm. we can set up the juice boxes and 
earn the ownership of those juice boxes. Those things can be decentralized very easily, but that's not an out of the box capability for most of these other groups, I think, that are trying to build something in this space or any of the DAO spaces. Yeah. Right. I mean, (laughs) right? It seems like a lot of the DAOs have just kind of taken, it's an investment partnership. It's like, you know, like they're doing things that are like just, I think, a little more traditional than. Mm -hmm. I I agree. It's like, it's it's a window (laughs) dressing. It's like, we're a DAO, we're a DAO. Yeah, no, I totally catch what you're saying. And it's interesting that you bring up the idea of following the ethos of the level of detail and care that Juicebox has put into being able to become this amazing decentralized tool. And, you know, I definitely get that same level of attention to detail and care for growing that within Studio Doubt. And you've recently said in a Twitter space that the issue is not, can you fund a movie, but can you do it repeatedly? And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the steps that you're taking in order to make Studio DAO sustainable. Totally. Well, I think it's about curating interesting ideas. If the movies that are up for funding on Studio DAO are just like not interesting, that won't be repeatable. What we're heading towards and like what this like first year is about is getting the first one funded, but then also we want people to come back and fund more than one movie. That's where there's like a network effect that has not existed so far, right? Like most crowdfunding experiences, people do it once because there's no ongoing tangible value for them. And for us, we want that ongoing tangible value to be being a member of Studio DAO and the activities and the projects that come up for funding later should also be super important. So, so we need to have a pipeline of, I think, both new experimental projects that can be get funded at a relatively low level and then things that are funded at a higher level that are attracting talent that could be making films at any other studio and so for us that's about talent relationships and becoming the definitional way that people integrate crypto-based, decentralized crowdfunding into the media business. We want to define how that works. We want to do that by being super friendly with as much talent as possible. And that means being a part of that ecosystem. So we have a partnership with a great production company. It's more than a production company. They're artist reps called the Gotham Group. And they are an advisor to Studio DAO. They have a lot of great talent. Their job is helping their talent create projects, get those projects sold and financed. And that's the core of their effort. So teaming up with companies like Gotham Group, and there are a number of fantastic companies in that league that are all looking for new ways to create projects. So we want to partner with those groups and just build a great pipeline of filmmakers and writers and creators who see the opportunity to basically not have to pitch to studios, but just go direct to the audience and to build their projects in public with that audience. That's the path towards multiple projects. I think the other part of it is the regenerative part of the revenue that comes back to the community then is available for greenlighting additional projects. So as we have more projects in market, it starts to scale up in terms of being able to afford to greenlight new projects without having to get more capital into the DAO. That's where it becomes regenerative. And that's like probably at least three or four years out until we get to that step. So I think it's about quality projects and a consistent pipeline of them so that even if you look and you decide not to fund a project today, you want to come back later because there's other things that are going to become available. You've described Studio Dow as competing directly with Netflix, which <laughs> is no small feat. <laughs> so what are, what are some of the biggest challenges that come with building such an ambitious project? We have faith in you, Kenny. We're just, we're just wondering what it feels like to go up against this behemoth. I don't think we are competing directly, directly with Netflix for the same projects at all. I think it's what it is, is when people are looking at what they're watching and what they're caring about, there's certain things that are not making it through the algorithmic filter at Netflix. 
and for reasons that are not quite clear. So people who have those projects are now like looking for other places to take them. And I think that's where we compete is Netflix has a certain business model and they can afford a lot of content, but they can't afford all the content. And I think that our model at scale actually can be much bigger because it's not monolithic and it's more efficient. So you're paying Netflix $16 a month or $20 a month. Only half of that is going into actually making content. The other half is just getting sucked up into the rest of their corporation. The place where we kind of like compete, but not really is, can we be a more efficient transmitter of audience desire and audience money into projects? Mm -hmm. Like if I give Netflix $20, do I get $40 worth of value back out of that? Am I getting $10 worth of value? Am I getting 20? Am I getting 40? I think that if we get more efficient by just letting people pick on their own, we can be more efficient in turning their dollars into projects. That's where we want to compete, is really just like on a basic capital allocation basis. Right. And when Studio Dow mainnet, do we have a date? <laughs> we need we need to go live with version with uh, <laughs> NFT rewards first. I don't know. Let me let me look at Discord right now. We're gonna find out right now. Like <laughs> I think we're getting close. I think we're getting close. The beautiful thing is you don't need to wait for it to be on mainnet to go out and get your first tokens to be a part of Studio DAO. So there will be links to the Rinkby Juice box where we can start to buy the tokens. And what we have figured out is how to allow voting on mainnet. You can vote with snapshot from tokens that you've gotten on Rank mm, okay. So so we're actually going to be selling off of Rank B, selling in air quotes, right? Because it's whatever. And then starting to govern on mainnet as we go into that. But if you want to go take a look now, right? I don't know if you guys have seen this. How much Rink B do you have? This is just a random question. Do you have a lot of Rink B? <laughs> we're we're, we're not Rink B? ETH whales. you not uh, Rink yeah. <laughs> But we can, we'll definitely link to the Studio DAO project on Rink B in the show notes, for sure. We will make sure that it's in there. Yes, exactly. We've got a bunch of juice boxes up there that we've been messing around with. And also, if you need Rink, we're giving it out. I, I was able to go, I found when I went into Gnosis, I realized that the original SharkDAO wallet on Rink B was still live there. And it had 500 Rink B ETH and seven Rink B nouns in the wallet. It's a high security, two of 10 Gnosis safe. <laughs> and I got Goldie to come back in. So I, I was able to cut loose 200 of the Rink B ETH from the original Shark Dow wallet. So we have plenty of Rink B to hand out. And <laughs> I, I want to play test the whole thing. Like, I want to like just get it working. So we have like a bunch of films that we've made up that are not real films that have their own juice boxes. So we have essentially a full run through of the system running on Rink B. And then we'll do that for a little bit. And then I think the people who play along with that, maybe something nice will happen. Who knows? And then I think we'll go on to main, I would say three to four weeks from now. I'm just going to kind of go out there and say, that's what I think we're heading towards with our first film. All right. Sounds good. And what is the best way for someone to get involved with Studio DAO? Where should they go? What should they do? Depending upon their orientation, we're totally happy to get connected on Discord to come into the Studio DAO Discord. Uh, also, on Twitter is a great place to engage us, and we're getting very active there, doing a bunch of spaces and starting to share some special elements of some of the projects that are going to be going live soon. And uh, yeah, so I think those those are the two main places. And you can always send me an email if that's, if that's what you want to do. At Kenny at studiodow.xyz is also easy if that's the way you'd like to do it. We're looking for filmmakers. We're looking for film fans. We're looking for people who want to be a part of the community and just, you know, core contributors like we need to like build up the culture a little bit and that's i think something that we're really looking forward to spending the fall doing is just getting to know a lot more people and growing the filmmakers that we're working with sweet all right 
Thanks so much, Kenny, for your time and for breaking down this oh my God. incredibly juicy and <laughs> ambitious new venture with us. We're big fans and we're really excited to see where it goes from here. It's so great to talk about it with you guys and I appreciate the enthusiasm and, you know, LFG. It's going to be, it's great. This is year two of the adventure. We're super appreciative of your time and it's always fun to talk to people who are building cool shit on Juicebox. So that's really what it's all about. So thanks again, Kenny. Awesome. Thank you both. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of the Juicebox podcast. You can find us online at juicebox.money and on Twitter at juiceboxeth. Join the conversation at discord.gg slash juicebox. The Juicebox podcast is for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. Views expressed by guests and the hosts do not reflect the views of Juicebox DAO or the Juicebox podcast. The Juicebox podcast is not investment advice or a solicitation to make any financial decisions. Projects on the Juicebox protocol are not vetted by Juicebox DAO. Each project on the Juicebox protocol is responsible for its own crowdfunding parameters. The tokenomics of one project may differ from other projects on the protocol. Do not purchase JBX tokens, other cryptocurrencies, or make contributions to projects in anticipation of financial returns. Please Please do do your your own own research. research.